Um, so this, uh, welcome everybody, this is a uh, Manchester Game Studies Network um, seminar. It's part of our summer series of monthly seminars that we've been holding um, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm really um, happy today to welcome a series of great scholars who've been working um, on loads of different areas to do with play and games and death. Um, our host today is Matt Coward Gibbs who is uh, an integral member of the Death and Culture Network at the University of York and editor of a forthcoming volume called Playing Dead, which looks at the intersection of play and games and death studies. So he's gonna be leading us through this sort of round table today and introducing everybody that you see on the screen. So I'm gonna um, hand over to him to, to lead us through the chat. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Chloe. And it's great to see everyone here. Um, and have a chance to talk about the volume. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, Playing Dead was held in, it was a symposium held in 2018 at the University of York. Um, and from that kind of came this call for a volume which connected um, scholars who attended that event, spoke at that event with um, also an event called Game in the Gothic that was held at the University of Sheffield. And um, what we tried to do in this volume is just create a really rich and diverse set of conversations around the intersections between death, culture and leisure. Um, so I think if we just take a moment then to let everyone introduce themselves and I think on my screen it looks like Ewan is next to me and then we'll go round in a circle. So um, can we start with yourself Ewan? Hi, yes, my name's Ewan Kirkland. I teach at the University of Brighton and am uh, in charge of the uh, the animation and the Games Art and Design degree programmes. And my contribution to this book is a, a, a continuation of some work I've been doing about the relationship between video games and Gothic literature. Um, my particular chapter was exploring the um, walking simulator um, or in interactive narrative game, um, What Remains of Edith Finch. And then I think next we come to Beth. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name's Beth. I live in rural Cornwall in the UK um, and I teach for the Open University on interdisciplinary modules, mostly English literature and uh, creative writing, yeah, like reflective learning modules and interdisciplinary humanities stuff. And um, my chapter for the book is kind of pursues my interest in how narratives and stories offer us ways to make sense of the world and our experiences. So it looks specifically at TV shows where the dead come back sort of as themselves rather than as hungry zombies or or as vampires or anything like that so some of the shows are dead like me i zombie and american horror story and it sort of takes a playful approach to those by looking at what kind of self-help messages we might learn from the dead in these kind of tv shows that's great thank you um and then vivian Hi, I'm Vivian. I am the co-founder of altac.uk, which is a new organization dedicated to providing alternatives to both academics and academia. Um, I presented and have written a chapter on the Slender Man, which was the last big research project that I did. I study online storytelling and other virtual narratives. Um, I was very interested in monsters and particularly the Slender Man and what online monsters have to tell us about uh, the communities there and about ourselves, really. That's wonderful, thank you. And uh, Paolo? Hi, this is Paolo. I work at the University of Liverpool, Communication and Media Department. Uh, I'm connected from London at the moment. And uh, I've contributed with a chapter on non-human video games. Um, so it's a chapter where I look at some kind of recent experiments in um, uh, video games made or played by non-human actors, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence or, uh, uh, or, for instance, games that play by themselves where the player doesn't need to do uh, any intervention. Some of these games are more experimental, artistic, some others are very mainstream, like smartphone apps, or uh, they, they, there are kind of non-human features in um, uh, tribal A video games. And they connect this sort of uh, strange fascination and the weirdness and creepiness of some of these uh, games with the fascination for the imaginary of a post-anthropocene, of a world without humans, where humans are no longer 
the, the, the active subject, the active actor of, uh, that determines the, the future of planet Earth. Uh, so I kind of, it's um, kind of speculative um, look in this sort of kind of contemporary right, recent experiments in non-human gaming, which I hope can possibly also raise some form of imaginaries and questions about uh, human survival on planet Earth in times of the, you know, sixth mass extinction and uh, global warming and so on. Thank you very much. And then if we wheel back round to um, Chloe, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, your contribution and, and yeah. et cetera. Yeah. I realise I didn't introduce myself properly. <laughs> I was just like, hi, welcome. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Chloe Germain Buckley. I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University, where we host the Game Studies Network, um, which I'm part of. I'm also part of the Centre for Gothic Studies there. So like you and, um, and Beth, kind of interested in Gothic and culture and, and um, that kind of thing, as well as games. And my... Um, chapter in the volume looks at the crossover of literature and games but in books that are use game-like features or that are gamified and it's really an investigation of the gamification of um, zombie fiction and non-fiction so looking at things from Max Brooks through to kind of book tie-ins to things like lifestyle apps so the zombies run lifestyle app and thinking about how zombies have become a tool for gamification that's great, thank you. So I think a lot of this volume and a lot of the, the work we did moving forward to this was kind of accepting this kind of idea that there may be gray areas or that we may be working in the realm of the once removed and there may be some space for discussion and disagreement between, between us and that's okay. Um, so I think given that it'd be really interesting just to kind of ask you is how you figure the relationship that you've drawn out between play and death in the context of what you've written and also more just your general um, kind of thinking and other work. Um, let's, I, I suppose if we go the opposite way around, so should we start with Chloe this time? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess we, I think we should also get your take on this as editor of the volume at the end. I think it'll be interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I've been interested in the way in, in which play and games a, a offer a kind of mastery, or at least in the text I was looking at, they seem to offer a kind of mastery um, around anxieties of death and failure. So all the texts I'm looking at have high rates of death and failure. And there's mm. kind of a fun element to that, that you know, you there's many outcomes of this adventure game book where you end up getting eaten by zombies and it's sort of um, very tongue in cheek. But there's a, that the gamified elements of the text offer you some mastery over that sort of helpless situation. And then moving on from that, thinking about how that feeds into slightly more pernicious aspects of gamification. So um, in support of quite individualistic ideologies, quite macho ideologies as well. Um, I'm thinking about the ways in which games can um, pro reinforce those rather more negative aspects that we're seeing in our society at the moment. Um, so yeah, on the one hand, it seems very playful, very fun, offers an opportunity to, to gain some kind of mastery in seemingly hopeless situations. But on the other hand, there's a slightly more pernicious ideological um, feature at work in, in this relationship, particularly where zombies um, come into it. No, absolutely. And I think, I think the monstrous in that sense become kind of a very powerful tool to explore this a lot of the times as well. And that's something that, um, uh, a number of the chapters kind of picked up on throughout the volume, including Beth's work and Vivian's work. Um, so if we can go to Paolo now. Yeah, um, so my take on this, and this is not necessarily something that I've explored in, my, in this specific chapter, but in other writing, is that there is a tendency to think of play as an active process, where the player is a sort of an active agent that uh, as a very specific, um, a very specific kind of intervention, conscious intervention on the ludic system, and uh, and this is very visible. This sort of imaginary in um, other phenomena, such as gamification, for instance, which is entirely based on the idea that the activity of the player can become a potential source of data for brand engagement, political participation, and so on. Um, but this is a, a perspective that is framed on a kind of very con recent understanding of play in our culture. Uh, authors such as Roger Kelois, for instance, uh, who is often cited in, in game studies, 
uh, was actually much more aware that the playful activities can become very much more complex, perhaps even more uh, dark and and and, um, um, and 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 nuanced than what we are used to think. And very often, he, I mean, for Kelwa, what his um, original study into play was into the the phenomenon of mimicry in the animal kingdom. Uh, the idea that animals tend to uh, become assimilated in the surrounding environment. And very often we tend to think of this as an activity that is for survival, for a very specific purpose. But as you observe, actually very often animal species tend to uh, even um, use mimicry at their own, uh, at the cost of their own survival. So it, it is not a, an instrumental activity. It's almost like an instinct, a desire for becoming assimilated in the surrounding environment and losing oneself into the environment. And for Kelois, human phenomena such as uh, fashion or, or imitation, role playing, and generally playful activities are much more similar to this sort of desire for losing oneself into an environment, for disappearing as subjects into, into the surrounding environment. So it is actually much more similar to a desire for, for death, for, for the disappearance of the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, so from this perspective, I think we can kind of see some playful activities as uh, much more complex and not necessarily as uh, requiring like the active conscious participation of the player, but more as instinctive uh, desires for for uh, for uh, the for losing ourselves. You can you know connect this with gambling or with you know other forms of addiction if you like. Mm. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. I think the idea of losing yourself and creating moments and creating ideas is something again it's a it's a theme that kind of connected the entire volume together and i suppose actually that idea of that those ideas of creation and losing yourself actually lead really nicely into um what vivian discussed in the volume and i was just wondering if you could pick up on the idea of the relationship with play and death a little bit more yeah so my relationship with this kind of topic is very spe uh, specific to the community that i was looking into which is also a very fluctuating community online communities, you know, just by their nature are not exactly static. Um, and uh, even this one in particular shifts constantly throughout time. So I was really trying to grab just a snapshot of, of one point in time for, for this community. Um, but a lot of what we found was that there's a, a playful engagement with the unknown and trying to make sense of the unknown through their own engagement of play. Um, and it actually allows people to engage with different ontological realities, different understandings, um, and throwing themselves into different ideologies. They'll wear a, a certain hat one day in order to say, well, this is how I'll understand things, and tomorrow I'll wear a different one. Um, and they see no problem with that. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of losing yourself, not only in the idea of the fear or the monster, but also in the process of storytelling. Um, the idea of these stories are that you contribute one element and it gets lost in the larger mythology. So your particular story isn't supposed to stand out as this grand narrative with your name attached to it that will get published one day or anything like that. It's all about just contributing to some larger narrative. So the individual and the individual's creativity ends up getting kind of sucked into a larger thing and getting completely lost, but that's actually the goal. So uh, the thing that a lot of people fear happening to their work and their creativity is actually what's being sought after. And it ends up mimicking a lot of the same ideas that they're communicating in relation to death and a loss of self uh, when uh, interacting with a monster. Mm. And again, yeah, that's that's very interesting. So that, that idea of loss of self and identity work, I suppose, is something that actually is kind of paralleled or turned on its head a little bit within your chapter, Beth, and where then these monstrous figures kind of retain their sense of individualism or individuality. I was just wondering if you might want to pick up on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. It's so interesting to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, I have a three-year-old, so for me, I've learned in recent years that play can be almost anything. Um, and I like the idea of kind of getting lost in that, in that moment with play as well. Um, in the chapter that I wrote, I sort of pick out some moments in, in television series where characters are sort of talking about one thing, but really they're 
perhaps on another level talking about life and death and these kind of broader little ideas, um, big ideas in fact. So there's one bit where there are two characters, one who's dead and one who's alive, and they're playing uh, miniature golf. And they're sort of talking about miniature golf and how to progress with the game. And one says, oh, you know, the point of the game is to keep on playing it and, and keep playing here and get our, our time out of this game. And another character who's alive and going to die naturally one day uh, says, yeah, maybe, but if we don't finish, it sort of becomes pointless, doesn't it? So there's all these sorts of moments where the conversation is about one thing, but maybe it's about another. And I think I like them because they're not explicitly about life and death, but they show how sort of the day-to-day -day playful activities in our lives can open up discussions about mortality and what value is in life and where you might find that value. Um, and I think one of the frameworks I've found really useful for thinking about this is actually from another book that's in the Death and Culture series from Emerald by Ruth Penfold Mounts called The uh, Death uh, the dead and popular culture and she talks about provocative uh, morbid spaces and the idea of like a framework of having different kinds of spaces where you can have different places for thinking about death in quite different ways so they might be safe spaces or they might be provocative spaces but they're all spaces where you're using culture as a way to make sense of engage of and engage with and like think about death and dying in life um, I think culture in so many ways can offer that those opportunities I think that's very interesting as well. And again, we're, we're seeing another parallel here with kind of Ewan's work and the idea that within Edith Finch and the notion of spatial and spatial engagement within that game and the way that relates to death and play in itself. And I was just wondering if you could pick up on that a little bit for us. Yeah, well, my, my work is, um, is uh, largely in, in terms of uh, video games and uh, video games are full of death. Um, from the beginnings with Space Invaders and, and, and Pac-Man, you have a limited number of lives. Um, going through the, the gameplay involves um, multiple deaths, both in terms of the player dying and also in terms of killing, quite often killing adversaries. So um, I'm very interested in the way in which games which are drawing upon um, Gothic tropes are kind of reflecting upon ideas of death uh, quite often very kind of self-consciously. So uh, I've, I've written a piece about the presence of zombies in, in video games, which I think is, is, is really interesting because in, in, zombies have been a kind of recurring feature of the, the video game since its inception. And it's quite interesting to see the ways in which particularly um, games which are maybe gothic in, in theme or tone are being quite self-reflexive in, in engaging with what, what death actually means. Because of course, in video games, nobody dies it's it's all it's all um simulated um and also um in particular you know, contemporary games when you when you die you you immediately resurrect so death has this kind of very peculiar um it's something which you, you know you're desperately trying to avoid but at the same time it's kind of inconsequential or at least doesn't have the, the same level of consequences as it does in in other kinds of popular culture um and Edith Finch is a very interesting game um, because it involves a protagonist moving through a, a kind of ancestral family home, um, uncovering stories which tell of the last few minutes of the um, various family members' lives. Um, and as a player, as these sequences are interactive, you, you're effectively tasked with bringing about the death of these these protagonists. And it's it's, it's interesting what Beth was saying about the um, the point of you know playing a game is to enjoy the play, but also to end it, because unless you reach some end point, it becomes pointless. And so the player is put in this very peculiar position where they're effectively having to effectively kill the, the character that, that they, they're becoming. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a game which really kind of, um, yeah, draws attention to the presence of death within video games. Um, and is maybe in, in encouraging players to maybe reflect upon um, what those processes actually mean. Can I can I jump in, Matt, and and and, and suggest a link between what Ewan's just said and, and your paper at the at the conference and that ethical, the ethical turn there that Ewan identifies in games. So uh, some of the things I was talking about, then they're, they're not really interested in in the ethics of death, but certainly the example Ewan gives is, and the one that you talked about at the conference in 2018, that was it that dragon cancer yes. as a. The, the ethics of death in games, but maybe a different use for death in games 
than the one that is in the triple the you know the triple kind of a games and the sort of um shoot them ups and stuff so can i'd be really interested to hear you speak back to what, what ewan's just said there in relation to your research no absolutely and i think that's that's fascinating in a sense um so so my paper that i gave it playing dead and that is in the volume focuses on fat dragon cancer which is um designed pretty much by um a father as a memorial to um his child who died from um terminal uh, cancer after quite a long battle and the game itself was was built as that form of memorial so i i i work and look at the way in which this game was crowdfunded and it became kind of a a collective memorial for individual involvement and engagement within that and i suppose the again it draws back on these ideas of inevitability and finishing and ending moments and and the way these ending moments work in in games and i suppose the way that the kind of embroiled meritocracy of what we see within AAA titles again kind of comes back into that because it questions what we take from a game i suppose but in a sense also what we emotively and culturally leave with that game when we're playing that as well i think having and again as as you said kind of being responsible almost in, for the death of these characters you are taking an active role in going on this journey with people and i suppose in that sense where we're seeing maybe a more emotive turn with play and the relationship between play and death mm, and the different cultural work that games might do for death for working through death and grief and and, and mourning and memorialization rather than um killing and mastery and that kind of thing mm. thanks matt Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. So I think that kind of brings us then to a question that's probably a little bit more generic and a little bit more speculative. And that's within kind of our, our, our wide ranging disciplines that we are involved in. Do What do we think the future holds or the next step is for kind of cultural death or death adjacent studies? Um, I don't know what what way round to go in this time. I think we'll go, should we go Beth first? Yeah, I was just thinking I uh, attended the great Altac conference a couple of days ago as well. Um, you know, it was really excellent to, to be a part of that. And I've been thinking uh, in terms of this question about some of the sort of infrastructures that have popped up in terms of, of this idea of death studies or, or the study of death uh, and culture. I was watching a Tara Brabazon talk earlier where she's saying like if you see the word studies after something it's usually an indication that it's a pretty interdisciplinary space or that it's trans or post-disciplinary in some way but it takes time for like, infrastructures to pop up around that to support that kind of study and of course we have the death and culture network at York which has been so great and conferences coming out of that the Emerald series itself is, is kind of a good way to to move that stuff forward but uh yeah, I hope that those kind of infrastructures help to legitimise a little bit. I'm getting a bit of an echo here, are you? A little, I'm yeah. I'm myself back. <laughs> Hopefully I'll go now. Yeah, I think they can help to kind of, those kind of infrastructures can help to legitimise what can sometimes be quite a, a hostile environment towards research that doesn't have a necessarily clear perceived value or impact coming out of it. Um, so for me, certainly when I was completing my PhD, I found... Uh, that sort of had a death focus as well. I found it so helpful to find this kind of idea, like a space of death studies, these different networks, organisations, conferences, where the idea of looking at something in quite an interdisciplinary way and thinking about text and culture quite broadly had a kind of space where I could meet people, learn from people, sort of have something to hang a discipline on. Um, but at the same time, you don't want it to then become exclusive and and a, a, a core group that's elitist in any way or, or anything like that so I think for me I've, I'm hoping that the future holds a lot more great stuff like that there's the queer death studies network coming out of Sweden um, and the radical death studies group in the US those kind of things that I really enjoy following and hope to learn more from. That's wonderful thank you and I think I, I really like this idea um, of almost becoming theoretical scavengers in this post-disciplinary age in which we can kind of move and connect from that. And I suppose in a sense that that really actually makes me think of um, Paolo's um, earlier monograph, actually um, Future Gaming, where he uses ideas such as around the 
and the the burial of games in New Mexico and falling out of love with kind of the Nike fuel band and things like that. And I was just wondering maybe um, if you have some thoughts regarding this kind of future for death or death adjacent studies. Uh, the future of that. Uh, I, I don't know. Well, it's not easy to say. Uh, my impression is that at the moment there is um, probably a change in the kind of common, you know, in the, in the discourses around that. Uh, I've been following the, uh, you know, the conversations and debates around the glo global warming and um, uh, the, the six mass extinction and the Anthropocene, which seem to <clears throat> bring back um, an understanding of that as a societal issue rather than an individualized uh, problem. And with the COVID-19 crisis that we are currently uh, living, um, there is, a, I would say, a similar kind of uh, dualism. There is, on the one hand, the problem of having to deal with uh, uh, an issue that affects uh, our entire society and, and the, the entire world, uh, but then at the same time, the responses are very often still framed on an individual responsibility, staying alert, wearing masks, keeping distance, and so on. And, but it, I think that all these events of, you know, our kind of contempt, sorry, oh dear, yeah, I got an echo. Um, all these events of contemporary, like recent history are uh, very much bringing forward the, the problem of death, of having to confront the, the possibility of dying. Um, and my impression is that this is becoming more and more perceived as a, not just as a, you know, a, an individual issue, but it's more of a, of a societal issue, something that really concerns uh, humanity. So I think it, it, cultural studies more generally have uh, very much con been concerned with the question of ethics and how to, what to make of the, of the time that we have between now and uh, the end of our life. So in a sense, I think have, there is a privileged position in kind of reframing the discourses around that at a time where pretty much everyone is talking about that or is dealing with uh, their own, the possibility of their own dying or someone you know, close to them dying um, uh, at any time. Um, so yeah, I think there is a, there is a, um, there, there is a need to, there is really a necessity to, 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 to talk more uh, um, to, to change the discourses around that in, in our society. Thank you, that's really interesting. And I think those um, kind of ideas around ethics and change of discourse is something that, again, as, as Beth said before, um, really came um, to the forefront at Altac's conference earlier this week, which Vivian obviously is a, a co-founder of. And I think that kind of powerful movement and change is is something that we're really starting to see kind of come to the forefront. I was wondering, Vivian, um, would you like to, to comment on that for us? Yeah, I thought it was interesting when I was looking um, with this question that I think if you had asked any of us this question about four months ago, you would have gotten vastly different <laughs> answers than you do now. The world has really altered dramatically and I think um, for one, a lot of people are talking about death who probably never talked about death before. Um, and that can help a discipline grow. Uh, and one of the things that Altac was really working towards was an interdisciplinarity to have people talk amongst each other. That doesn't really happen much in academia. There's a lot of issues with academia that I won't get into, but one of them is that academics tend to talk to the same people over and over and over again. As some, I've only really been in it for about four or five years, but whenever I go to my conferences, I see the same people at the same conferences all the time. And so I find myself saying the same things to the same people year after year. And we want to break that down and we want to suddenly have someone who studies, um, you know, architecture in Japan to suddenly be talking to someone who does death studies and they find themselves actually having a lot to say to one another and to learn from one another and you know I think it's death is such a part of the human experience that to really study people we can't forget that whole side of things and so um, I, I do thank quite a lot of the the death studies people who were at that conference on Tuesday uh, I think it really helped to drive home that particular study group. It also led a lot of people to be talking about those kinds of issues. Um, so yeah, I, I think that um, the future of, of anything really right now is very difficult <laughs> to try to predict, but I, I do hope that at least conversations will be had. And that's something that I, I think 
can definitely happen. What Florida's communications taken might be different than they have in the past. Um, in fact, I really hope that they're different than they were in the past. Uh, and I hope that we also talk outside of other academics as well, that we don't just talk to other people in other fields, but that we extend outside of this ivory tower and talk to people about what it is that we study and we learn. Thank you. I think some some of the ideas kind of coming up there about extending outside are actually really interesting then when we think about um, not only the Gothic and Gothic fiction, but the the kind of intense relationship that the Gothic does in itself have with death. So I was wondering, Ewan, could you, could you draw on that a little bit for us? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, the things that I think um, makes uh, studying video games so interesting is that kind of interdisciplinary nature that I think a lot of you have been talking about. I've been writing about video games for about 15 years now. And it's interesting that the kind of scholars that are drawn to, to this particular area do come from a whole range of different backgrounds. And quite often it'll be someone who says, I, I, I'm a historian and I play video games uh, as a hobby. And then I realized that I could sort of use my, I could sort of use my academic skills to kind of un unpick what's going on in, in, in this, in this particular title. Um, I mean, I think the, um, the uh, the presence of, of gothic themes in video games is a, is something which um, dates all the way back to the kind of beginning of Space Invaders and, and Pac Man and, and Haunted House. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to unpick in the work that I'm doing is um, just how extensive that relationship is. Whether it's a, a purely kind of aesthetic one, if we have like, zombies are make good villains to be destroyed no one feels anxious or, or kind of uncomfortable about shooting hordes of zombies whereas hordes of people or soldiers might might be more kind of un, un, unsettling um so there's there's kind of the ways in which you know certain gothic themes and tropes do do kind of feed into some of the kind of mechanics of of game play um and i think it's one of the things that's interesting about um games at the moment is uh, i mean I, i'm hearing this, this term kind of maturity coming up quite a lot as 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 game scholarship matures and gets into its kind of like second decade as um academics are maybe more in more likely to engage with games in a kind of serious way um as uh, video games start to enter into kind of media studies and film studies programs um and but also the ways in which um games players are maturing and also games designers i mean now there is a history of of games which can be productively drawn upon um and referenced and and i think it's um interesting when we start to see games which are um engaging with the processes of gameplay i mean one one game which i'm I was thinking about other games which also kind of like deal with ideas of death and make the player feel discomforted by what they're doing in a way which is quite gothic is a, a game called Manhunt which caused a, a quite a lot of controversy when it came out um, I think it was over 10 years ago now which is a game where you you are put in the position of killing people but also made to feel that what you're doing is wrong or, or but you still have to do that in order to complete the game so there's this kind of real tension which is which is created between the desire to complete the game and also that sense of implication in what's going on and of course games are that's one of the things that games can do they can implicate the player or the the, the in in what they're performing in a way in which uh, obviously films and television shows and book, books can also do that but it seems that games are particularly um well positioned to 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 cause that to create that those moments of, of reflection thank you yeah and i think it is it is that game of that almost positionality to an extent within the game and that you you take on i suppose in in play you take on an active role in that engagement and that experience absolutely and i was wondering i suppose that in the sense kind of configuring quite heavily to a lot of your work, Chloe, um, with uh, kind of live action role play as well, and actually oh. being in space and in physical environments and engagements. I, um, in terms of that, I mean, I've got lots to say about that. It, it, um, in taking game studies and the implications of player death into a space that is embodied, as in live action role playing games or tabletop role playing games, is something that I'm researching at the moment, and it's something that. Um, a colleague and a friend of mine are pushing more, for more widely in game studies, a kind of material turn. Um, 
to, to materiality. We're working on that at the moment. But in terms of your, your more specific question about death studies and, and its future, and from my position sitting within Gothic studies, a very small, and, and as Vivian rightly points out, often quite insular uh, discipline, um, there's a, a death, there's two definite terms occurring and I see them being mirrored in popular culture too in relation to death and that's the kind of the ethical turn I've already mentioned and the ecological turn that Paolo's mentioned. So we've got kind of two, two things, you've got gothic and death which weirdly haven't been much discussed really, there's a, a volume gothic and death recently published and, and it points out kind of the strange fact that often gothic studies not really interrogate the concept of death all that much and then gothic and games which um matt you, you mentioned the um the sheffield's gothic gaming conference and and a kind of uh, and and ewan's work and tanya krasinski's work in this area just kind of burgeoning in terms of the relationship between gothic and games and i think these two things are, are taking an increasingly an ethical turn so those working on gothic and games and gothic and death are thinking what are the ethical implications of the texts we're looking at. How are they positioning us as readers or players to think about the ethics of um, our own relationship with death and how we behave in kind of game spaces. And, and you can see that ethical turn in popular culture. If you look on Netflix and you think about texts that are about death, they're about ethics. So the good place is a really obvious example, but something like living with yourself, which I don't know if any of you have seen with Paul Rudd, where he goes to kind of have his life improved, but what actually happens is he does the spoiler, but he they kill him. They kill like the rubbish version of him and then they make a better one, they clone like a better one. Um and but then he he doesn't properly die, so he's living with this better version of himself. He's not quite a zombie. So there's all this sense of like becoming a better person after death. In really interesting ethical turn in the narratives about death in popular culture. On the one hand, that is happening, and that's really good and positive, and I'm, I'm liking and really interested in all those texts, and I think Gothic scholars need to be getting interested in those as well, and moving away from, um, you know, interest in the kind of classic, traditional Gothic texts uh, into these more kind of new and unusual ethical texts. But also, often don't have a lot of Gothic aesthetic or architecture in them, you know, they, they're quite the good places are very kind of shiny sunny um text it's not you know typically gothic but at the same time i'm really worried about um gamification paolo's mentioned gamification as a sort of linked to brands and marketing and, and he's written uh, about this as well i know and i during the covid19 crisis there's been a an, an, an interest in death and kind of a personal level the lack of people's uh, ability to be able to grieve at, at funerals and such has really brought that topic to the fore. But there's also been a pernicious gamification of death in the terms of numbers, um, kind of stats, how the government can use different stats to paint different pictures, kind of the competitive idea coming out there that, you know, where where world beating, as Boris Johnson likes to say all the time, or that like the numbers, the people, there's lots of charts and they're stacking up the different numbers of deaths in different countries. And there's a, a, a sort of a pernicious aspect to that where individuals and their lives and the ethics of all of that dissipates in the face of seeing death on that scale. Um, so I'm curious as to how scholars can deal with that challenge as well. Um, that's uh, quite apart, and that, that's not something I'm researching at all, so a very speculative answer there. I think that's very interesting because when we, especially that kind of ideas of numbers games, because when we think about digital games for the most part, we're, we're thinking about code, we're thinking about ones and zeros in the, in that kind of idea, and in essence there, there's, there's something about moving away from the association, in that sense, for me anyway, of kind of death within the game space or within the play space death and horror being so interconnected because there is this there's a death is a very natural process it's it's part a lot of the time of well it is part of life it is the end of life and no beth you've been working a little bit on this kind of idea of autothanatology and kind of writing about and understanding the end of life and i think we have this we're seeing this movement and this trend to kind of in a sense, reintegrate death. And I think now more than ever, 
more than ever, sorry, there's this need to see this wider reintegration of talk and conversations about death within to this society. Obviously, you've got things like death positivity movements, radical death studies, queer death studies. They're all kind of growing. And I think in the play space, and because play, for the most part, is this field of relative safety in which we can try things out and we can explore things that's where we see an exciting connection and i know we've seen a lot of applications coming out recently about um for children with grief and stuff and these kind of ideas of using play to embody and more open those conversations around kind of death in a more cultural term for me anyway <laughs> And I think that kind of draws widely to this kind of third main point. And that's kind of, for, for a long time, the Academy has widely rejected play. We've seen play start to become incorporated a bit more in such a pedagogical sense. So as we move into this kind of new decade, this post-COVID decade, as I'm sure many people will start to call it, what place do you see for the playfulness in academia? Um, if we could start with yourself, Chloe, that'd be great. Yeah, a, a brief answer from me. I just think that the academy in, in, across different disciplines is increasingly seeing play and games as a ubiquitous cultural and social mode that has a, that there's a lot, a lot to be said about and that might in fact do work um, to engage with social issues. So you've talked about, about apps and games that deal directly with grief that have a kind of application that's a therapeutic in some sense um, it's a fantastic games designer attached to the V&A, Matteo Menapace, and he's, um, he's working on games that deal directly with social issues, getting people to think about systems change, um, ecology, the environment, and things like that. So he's using games as a kind of tool to engage people directly. The same, um, same with another designer, games designer, we, um, we have a man met. While young, she's using games to start conversations around things like the civil rights movement, around things like what happens to people in probation. So difficult conversations, not, not just educational tools, but to start difficult conversations between groups of people. And, and the Academy is starting to embrace that more and, and hopefully it will continue. That's wonderful. Thank you. And can we, can we move back to Ewan? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question about why we haven't studied games up until relatively recently I mean um, and of course my area is in, in video games but also like sports and um, other kinds of competitive activity which are incredibly popular um, incredibly successful in, in terms of generating money and, and their, their popular impact and yet um, uh, within like cultural studies sport is not really given the the, the, the attention that it that it should should be given um, I mean I in, in game studies, there's always this kind of like this, this quite old, old chestnut of talking about games and narrative. And it's interesting that storytelling is seems to be something which we have as a, as a, as a, an academy had no problems exploring. There seems to be this kind of like almost like a privileging of narrative as, as a kind of the, the serious um, way of kind of engaging with, with, with culture. Whereas play has those associations of triviality associated with, with children um, that sense of, um, you know, rightfully so, that it is, it, is, it is in some ways kind of removed from the real. Um, but then how that, that then allows for, um, as, as, you, as, as Chloe was saying, for some kind of like um, uh, quite serious issues to be dealt with, but in a, in a safe space, in that kind of like magic circle. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that that term gamification is, is a slightly problematic one, but it is, is certainly interesting to think about the ways in which um, maybe it's not so much that things are becoming gamified as, as our perspectives of things are starting to incorporate um, ludic terms of reference, which allows us to have a kind of more interesting and nuanced perspective on the world. And um, I mean, the, 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 it, it, it might be a bit of a kind of a oversimplification, but you know, mo most things can be reduced to most experiences can be re reduced to narratives or they can be reduced to games. 
Um, so you can think of like a, an, an, any kind of experience as it can be narrated, but can also be thought of as a, as a series of objectives and, 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 um, and barriers which need to be overcome in order to, to, to achieve some goal at the end. So I think it's, it is really interesting the way we're seeing notions of ludification entering into the kind of academic vocabulary. And it's interesting to see how that's going to impact maybe on some of these more marginalized forms of popular culture being uh, considered as, as more respectable and getting more, more critical academic attention. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that kind of idea of the, the acceptance of all text, in a sense, in, in all text and the way in which academia is built on that principle that we should not deny anything in that sense we should not deny any form of cultural engagement or experience um, so can I can I ask the same question to Vivian yeah so I I, I enjoy the fact that I'm, I've been kind of seeing academia grow to start studying play a little bit more over the years um, but one of the things that I would really like to see is for academia itself to be more playful um, for it to not take itself so seriously um, I find that when one kind of lets themselves go and starts to play a bit more freely, you do not take yourself so seriously. And academia, I think, needs a little bit of that. Uh, it needs to put a lot of play into the way it conducts research. It um, can really open up a lot of boundaries when you kind of start to approach the research process in a lot more of a fluid motion and a lot more of a, of a playful motion of let's try on hats and see what happens kind of idea rather than being so structured and, and so worried about um, following set ideas. And um, I, I liked Derrida, therefore I need to relate this to this thing that I read and maybe let it go a little bit and just see where things take you and, and play with things a little bit more. Um, and also just the ways that we communicate with one another and formulate our ideas. Uh, one of the things that I always really enjoy about Altac meetings is that it's very playful, um, maybe sometimes to our detriment, <laughs> but sometimes to our positivity. I mean, for our, uh, our conference was titled the conference at the end of the world simply because we thought that was funny. Um, and people really liked it and it ended up opening up a lot of avenues to the types of papers that people presented simply because we were allowing ourselves to not be so serious in the way that we presented ourselves. And so I, I, it's something that I'd really like to see is for Altac, or to, um, for academia itself to just kind of let things go and to play with its own ideas, with its own uh, research endeavors and uh, with its own engagement with the world. Thank you, that's, that's really interesting. I think there's, there's something very interesting there to to play with around the idea of the, the gamification of the TEF and the REF and the NSS coupled with the lack of play across the academy. Um, Paolo, can I come to yourself, please? Yeah, um, well, I would say that, I, I, in my opinion, academia is... Can, can you hear me? Is everything okay? Yes, yeah. okay. Cool, dear, uh, we still kind of back. Anyway. Um, Academia has been concerned with playfulness uh, quite quite a lot, I would say, throughout the 20th century, in my opinion. Think about, you know, postmodernism or surrealism in art and culture. Um, but then at the same time, as many have argued, uh, for instance, Matthias Fuchs recently has been uh, writing and researching about, about this. It's possible that we have been talking about playfulness so much precisely because the, the last century has been probably the less playful um, uh, since a long time, um, think about how workplaces have become more and more playful at the same time when um, work and labor became more exploitative. Uh, think about how we work, for instance, uh, as this sort of strategy of having like very playful work environments while also at the same time implementing techniques of surveillance on, on workers which were unthinkable until a few years ago. Uh, so I think playfulness is quite conflictual in our contemporary society and, and my opinion is that the role of academia is perhaps now to think a bit more radically about, about playfulness, uh, probably drawing back on, a, on, the, on the tradition that actually started around the, at the beginning of the 20th century, that really introduced the notion of playfulness into 
art uh, and, and culture. I'm thinking of surrealism, but also Dadaism, uh, pataphysics, which is what I'm kind of uh, mostly interested about at the moment. Uh, where, in, 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 from this perspective, playfulness was a, a much more radical and, and, and politically kind of committed into proposing a critique of society. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's perhaps the kind of playfulness that we want to see, uh, that I would like to see in academia. Um, Bart Simon, not, not long ago, argued that for the necessity of game studies to be unserious, precisely from, from this perspective, from, from the idea that, you know, it is not necessarily, it's not just about uh, the idea of being playful, but it's about an, a sort of radical uh, playfulness. It's a playfulness as a form of critique. Um, so that's, I think, in my opinion, the way we can, we should uh, reframe the discourses about playfulness in our society. No, that's very interesting. Thank you. And, and Beth, could you could you um, offer us your thoughts on this idea, please? Yeah, sure. I'm all for radical playfulness. That that sounds really interesting. Um, and I like the idea of more space for joy and playfulness in in academia as well. And like playful approaches to research and writing, rather than per se uh, necessarily engagement with play in a sort of disciplinary sense but more thinking of like playful approaches to any any work or, or things like that but I, I, yeah there's definitely a lot of challenges in that and that some of the work I really enjoy reading has an you know always has taken quite a, a playful approach but those are often coming from quite established people with quite uh, established trajectories so I think playfulness is to some extent a, a tied to privilege in that if you are just starting out you you might not be able to take those different kinds of approaches that you might like to um, but then in some ways the pandemic situation might change that. I know a lot of people are, are sort of doing surveys saying, do you want things to stay the same after COVID-19? And people saying, no, no, most people want things to change. Whether they will change, I don't know. But there's been a lot of discussions in my house. My partner's also uh, uh, works at universities and, and writes and stuff like that. So we sort of think, well, when you decide to do something, are you, are you thinking, is this going to be good for my career? Or is it going to be good for this, that and the other? Or are you thinking, am I, am I going to enjoy this? Because I need to, I need to enjoy this, or I don't. It's not something I want to spend my time on. And I think it'd be nice if, if more people could make those kind of choices rather than feel that they have to do things a particular way or do certain things just because that's going to be what's required of them to adhere to a particular, you know, REF outcome in the UK or, or something like that. Thank you. I think what um, kind of every, everyone's chiming on the sense is the way in which kind of it there's a there's an element here in which kind of there's a I suppose a wider call for a more ethical and more um, sensitive approach to our practice as researchers and as academics as well. Um, I think that's very exciting, and I think there's a for for a long time I noticed that uh, there seems to be a distinction that if you introduce play then you remove rigor and i don't think that is the case and i think we need to look to work a bit harder and breaking down that kind of those assumptions or those binaries um i don't know how to do that and i can't provide an answer to that but i think that kind of deconstructionism is something that would be very exciting to see to the forefront um, so that kind of rounds us off to the end um of the kind of three main questions of the sessions um so I'm going to uh, hand back over to uh, Chloe to round this out. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, I want to say thanks to everyone for a really interesting and wide range of discussion about the kind of intersection of games and play, playfulness and death, um, things that we wouldn't automatically put together, but have lots of rich resonances and, and hopefully the book um, We'll, we'll, we'll show that even more. I'd like to ask Matt though, before you completely sign off, can you tell um, people who might be downloading this and listening to it, when the book is coming out, um, remind them what it's called, where they can get it from, um, things like just kind of useful info like that. that would be yeah, sure. So um, the full title of the book is Death, Culture and Leisure, Playing Dead. Um, it is published by Emerald um, and is available from uh, all local bookstops shops uh, and Amazon if that's where you get books from. Um, I believe the publication date is the 20th of August 2020 um, and uh, you can find out um, more details um, through Emerald's website or just the general Google. Cool and there's lots more chapters in there 
um, that are looking at loads of different intersections of play and death, not just games, but also stage plays and other things like that. So uh, quite a lot of game studies stuff in there, but also game studies in relation to other cultural studies and the humanities. So it's a really fab and um, interesting volume. So definitely check it out if you can. And thank you again to everyone for making time today and zooming in from various places to, to, to chat about this book and, and their contributions to it. So yeah. I think that's it and we're done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> right.